It was a windy day, and Wurzel Gummidge was out for a stroll, going the long way round from Ten Acre Field to the village. Good morning, ladies, he called civilly to a pair of placid cows. Fine day for chewing the cud. And the cows went on chewing as he plodded past. At a gap in the hedge, he stopped dead in his tracks and stared. His mouth opened wide in amazement. Well, mow me down and call me an haystack. For there in a field of sprouting sugar beet stood a female scarecrow, her arms stretched wide and her long full skirt flapping gently in the breeze. Wurzel Gummidge hurried towards her. Gee, we're over, over, dee, wizzle. And we're over, over, and we're over, and we're gee, he said. The scarecrow didn't move. Oh, uh, don't talk your own language, eh? Uh, that's a good start, that is. I'm saying good morning to me, you stupid old fossil. Make a good wife, I shouldn't be surprised. Well, don't talk then, see if I care. I'll do the talking and you do the cooking. That's a fair arrangement. Of course, we'd have to get married first. I'm asking you to marry me, you dumb docklehead. Why don't you answer? Are you going to be me ever loving wife or no? He gave the scarecrow a fierce jab with his elbow, knocking the silent head askew. Right, Neil, you've asked for it. Off comes your head. But just as he was about to take a gigantic swing at the female scarecrow's head, the crow man's soft voice drifted over the hedge. And what exactly do you think you're doing, Wurzel? Uh, 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 me, sir? Uh, uh, nothing, your incredibleness, sir. Babbled the scarecrow as the crow man took his arm and steered him back towards the ten acre field. At least, ways, uh, I was doing something, your enormousness. Uh, I was trying to get me a wife, sir. A wife, Wurzel? Whatever for? Uh, to make me tea, sir, and me breakfast, sir, Mr. Crowman, sir. Bacon and eggs and a, a bit of fried bread, same as what humans have, sir. Uh, uh, so I'm told, Your Honor, sir, by the other scarecrows, sir. What do the other scarecrows say when you tell them you want a wife? Well, uh, laugh at me, so they do, sir, on account of me being so ugly, sir. A scarecrow's meant to be ugly, Wurzel. I, I, I knows that, sir, but if I might make so bold, Your Reverence, Mr. Crowman, sir, I couldn't half do with an handsome head. A handsome head? But you've got half a dozen heads already, Wurzel. Why should you want an handsome head? Uh, to get me a wife, sir. Oh, so you think it's as easy as that, do you? Oh, I just that, your lordship, sir. Once I have an handsome head, nothing will stop me, sir. I have the pick of all the wives I want, so I will. And if you did have a wife, Wurzel, would you settle down in Ten Acre Field instead of rampaging through the district? Oh, uh, with that, Mr. Crowman, sir, I swears it on this here Robin Redbreast. And he slapped his stomach, waking the sleeping bird. Very well, Wurzel. It just so happens that Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton has asked me to make her a decorative scarecrow to stand on her lawn. So while I'm doing that, I'll lend you its head for a little while. Wurzel Gummidge scrambled to his feet. Oh, oh I thanks your iron mightiness. From the bottom of my boots, so I does your eminence, sir. The next day was bright and sunny. But John and Sue were gloomy as they trudged up the steps of Bloomsbury Barton Hall. For Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton had invited them to tea, and they would far rather have been out of doors enjoying themselves. And their father, trailing along behind them with his bag of tools, was just as glum. For he knew that he was only ever invited to tea when Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton had a job for him to do. A job, moreover, that she had no intention of paying for. In Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton's potting shed, the crow man sat humming strange little songs as he worked on the decorative scarecrow. At the sound of a car, he glanced up and watched for a moment as the three trailed up the steps to the hall's huge doors. Uh, Enid, called Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton a few moments later. Uh, bring the children some more cucumber sandwiches. I'm sure they're ravenous. She beamed at Mr. Peters, perched precariously at the top of a tall stepladder in a corner of the huge drawing room. A length of flex trailing from his hand. Uh, so kind of you to help me out, Mr. Peters. It's such a fiddling little job. Uh, not worth calling in a professional firm for. Oh, uh, think nothing of it, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Uh, the only trouble is I shall need another pair of hands. Uh, someone to uh, feed the water along the picture rail at the other end of the room. Uh, Enid, uh, go and tell that peculiar man in the potting shed to come here at once and give Mr. Peters a hand. Uh, what peculiar man, ma'am? That, uh, that, that, that scarecrow man, fetch him immediately. A few moments later, Wurzel Gummidge rounded a corner of the neat shrubbery and ran straight into the maid. Uh, excuse me, are you the scarecrow man? Oh, I am that. 
Any time you want any rooks going, you send for me, missy. As long as you can pay me wages, mind. Well, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton wants to see you. She's having tea in the drawing room. A tea, eh? <laughs> oh, I could do with some of that. I tell her I'm coming just as soon as I've changed me head, he said, setting off for the potting shed to see the crow man. And before a quarter of an hour had passed, Enid the maid was in the doorway of the drawing room at Bloomsbury Barton Hall, holding her hand to her mouth to cover her giggles. Please, ma'am. <laughs> it's the scarecrow man, ma'am. What on earth's wrong with you, girl? Show the man in at once and stop that ridiculous giggling. I uh, know. The maid stepped back and Wurzel Gummidge entered. Politely, he doffed his hat, revealing his new handsome head. And John and Sue immediately collapsed with laughter, scattering cake crumbs everywhere, for the scarecrow now looked most peculiar, with a snooty pointed nose, a tiny painted moustache that curled up at the ends, high arched eyebrows, a monocle on a length of green twine and black lacquered hair parted in the middle. Mr. Peters frowned at them and wagged a disapproving finger. Oi, you two, just you watch your manners. He called to the scarecrow. Uh, uh, right, sir, could you just take hold of that flex and lead it up to the picture rail? Uh, flex? Uh, uh, flex of what? I, I don't see no flex. Uh, that uh, length of wire. Ah, uh, no, 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 that's electric, that is. Can't be done with electric. Sets the body on fire, so it does. That will do, snapped Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. You are here to follow Mr. Peter's instructions. Wurzel Gummidge shook his head stubbornly. Uh, uh, no, not with electric, missus. No, I, I'll just sit down and have my tea. Get out of that chair at once. What do you think you're doing? For having my tea, replied Wurzel Gummidge civilly picking up a large plate of rock cakes and shoveling one to his mouth. And, um, ain't there no cream cake? I likes a bit of cream cake, so I do. You frowned at Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton. Have you had it all then, missus? Mr. Peters! Well, Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton, can't you do something? Here, uh, uh, John, uh, ask the gentleman to take hold of this wire. The scarecrow leapt to his feet as John approached, scattering rock cakes everywhere. Uh, you take it away. I, I won't have no electric near me. Take it away, he shouted. A loaded trolley shot away as he backed into it and crashed into the wall, showering cups and saucers and a pot full of tea all over the carpet. He grabbed a handful of rock cakes and hurled them wildly at John and Mr. Peters and then turned and threw one at Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton just for good measure, backing away from the wire towards the door. Go on, get, get off with it. Go away with that electric. Get out, get out. John ducked to avoid a flying bun, pulling without thinking on the wire, and heard a second mighty crash and a wail as his father and the stepladder toppled over onto the floor. At the other end of the room, the fleeing scarecrow overturned a cake stand and trod muffins and crumpets into the carpet in his desperate attempt to escape. Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton screamed, You stupid man! Now look what you've done! Leave my house, do you hear me? At once! Now! Wurzel needed no further encouragement. He fled. Back once more on the safety of the potting shed, Wurzel Gummidge tried to explain what had happened and watched dumbly as the crow man fixed his workaday head onto the scarecrow that Mrs. Bloomsbury Barton had ordered. Well, you went and upset everyone again, didn't you, Wurzel? Oh, not me, Mr. Crowman, sir. Not old Wurzel, Your Honour, sir. How could I upset everybody when I got such an handsome head? Wurzel, an handsome head is not enough. You have to be handsome inside. Ah, well, I ain't handsome inside, as well you know, Mr. Crowman, sir. All I has inside is, is twigs and straw and this pesky robin's nest. If it ain't too much trouble, Your Majesty, sir, would your iron madness make me handsome inside to go with me new handsome head? Oh, I'm sorry, Wurzel. I'm afraid I can't do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. But I'm only a poor stupid old scarecrow, Your Eminence, sir. You are what you want to be, Wurzel. And if you want to be handsome inside, you can be. Be kind and thoughtful and generous. And people will be kind and thoughtful to you. Will they, sir? Will they be kind to old Wurzel? Well, not all of them, but some of them will. And would I get me a wife, Mr. Crowman, sir? Only if you're handsome inside. It was like a vision to the scarecrow. Handsome inside. Oh, I'll be that, Your Honour, sir. I'll be handsome inside. 
suddenly jumped to his feet and he made for the door. The crow man rose. They doffed their hats to one another and Wurzel backed out of the potting shed, bumping straight into Esme the sheep. Dying blasted stupid, he began, and then remembered his resolution. I beg your pardon, Esme. A, a nice day for grazing, isn't it, Esme? Going for a little walk, are you, Esme? Uh, are you, Esme? Esme looked puzzled and then alarmed. She'd never known the scarecrow had been nice to her before, and it worried her. She took one pace back, then turned and ran. On his way back from Bloomsbury Barton Hall, Wurzel Gummidge decided to practice being handsome inside. He caught sight of an old lady carrying a heavy shopping bag, loped over to lend her a hand and helped her all the way back to her own front door. There you are, ma'am, and it was my pleasure to carry that there heavy basket, what with me being kind and thoughtful and, and handsome inside. Thank you. You're a true gentleman of the road. Uh, here you are. She delved in her purse and brought out a coin. Uh, would you like to take this for your trouble? Uh, what, what, is, what is that, ma'am? Is it wages? Well, it's only a tenpenny piece, but you have earned it. So I suppose you could call it wages. Well, now, I will take that, ma'am, and thank you kindly, for that's the first wages I ever had, he said happily, clutching the coin safe in his fist. He raised his hat to her, bowed politely, and set off again for Ten Acre Field, following the track across the cow field, which led to where the female scarecrow stood guarding the sugar beet. Good afternoon, ma'am, he began cheerfully. First off, I've come to humbly ask your pardon for what I said to you yesterday. Uh, uh, that was before I was handsome inside, that was, and I didn't mean it when I said I'd knock your head off. <laughs> uh, second, I, I, I've brought you my wages, what I've just had given to me, and I'm giving you them wages, because I want for you to be my wife. The other scarecrow said nothing. Wurzel Gummidge sank with difficulty onto one knee, clutching his hat to his chest, and gazed up at her adoringly. I want you to know as you're the most handsomest scarecrow I've ever seen. As handsome as me, so you are, and I'm asking you to marry me. Wurzel Gummidge saw a gobbet of mud fall from the female scarecrow's face, as first one eye, and then both, flicked open. For a moment she stared at his new handsome head, and then threw back her own head, opened her mouth, and screeched with laughter. What are you laughing at? he demanded, struggling angrily to his feet. There ain't no call for you to laugh. Do you stop that there corn and cackling, or I'll give you some of the corn cackle for it. You stop it, do you hear me? You stop it! And he swung his fist at her, knocking her hat off. She stopped laughing at once, grabbed a battered old broomstick, and promptly hit him back. Ah, he growled. So that's the way of it, is it? You scruffy old beezum, he bellowed, and he belted her again. Soon there was a full-scale fight going on, and Wurzel Gummidge was getting the worst of it, moaning and groaning as the female scarecrow swam her broomstick, screaming with delight. <laughs> On his way home, the crow man happened to pass the field of sugar beet. And there he found the female scarecrow stiff and silent on her pole, and the remains of Wurzel Gummidge scattered all over the place. Shaking his head sadly, he gathered up Wurzel Gummidge's arms and legs, and the new handsome head, and piled them carefully into the trailer of his old black tricycle. The next day the crow man spoke gently but firmly to the chastened scarecrow. Now, Wurzel, it's taken me half the day to put you together again. And I think it would be best if I took this handsome head, don't you? And put it back on the ornamental scarecrow in Bloomsbury Barton Park, where it belongs. So it would, Your Honour, Mr. Crowman, sir. Uh, I'm very, very sorry, so I am your eminence. And it won't happen again. Because I'm staying single from now on, Mr. Crowman, sir. <laughs>